or um, as we go tonight into Psalm chapter 9, I wish you would join me there, please, in Psalm chapter 9. Um, and we are, that. listen, this is kind of a maiden voyage for us when it comes to this kind of a format. We have no idea how long uh, we will have the privilege of these kinds of things. But shouldn't we be thanking God for technology tonight? If this had happened 10 years ago, uh, this kind of a crisis in our country, we would not have had access to these things. Frankly, we spoke to a couple of church members this week um, who uh, we, most of you got the news that we were doing what we were doing last Sunday morning and then also tonight. And I thank God that you got the news and we laughed a little bit as we chatted with people. There was one person who uh, said, I don't have a computer. And I said, well, would you like us to help you by bringing somebody or whatever? She said, no, no, no. She's going to watch David Jeremiah and she was good. And so I laughed. I thought that was a good thing. And so uh, hoping the rest of you will not follow her lead. Um, but I also um, just laughing at some of the statements that were made by others who uh, enjoyed a little bit of the format this week. And so we're just going to trust the Lord. He's going to use this time. And I thank the Lord that you've made it a priority. Thank you for giving us a few minutes on this Wednesday night. I happen to be looking at the screen in front of me, and it turns out that there are a total of about 33 screens that are open, including mine. And so uh, I hope that that means that there are a number of people that are just joining us tonight for prayer. And so as we continue tonight together, as we focus on prayer, a couple things I just want to say. I'm not going to close in prayer tonight. I'm telling you in advance. I'm, I'm asking you to look around in the room beside you. In fact, I happen to be looking in this room and I'm looking at my wife and my daughter and my son, Matthew. Jeremy's up in the balcony tonight and uh, Chris is lurking about the quarters here somewhere. But the bottom line is I'm hoping that you will get together with the people that are in your house tonight and pray as we close. This is what we do in here on Wednesday nights. And this is what I'm asking you to do tonight. I'm asking you to pray together as a family and pray as we talk about this in chapter nine of Psalms. I'm asking for you to be praying exactly this way as we go together tonight. Let me ask you a quick question as we begin this conversation. Do you ever struggle with change? Do you struggle with things that are not the same as they used to be? Now, I ask this question. Anybody that's close to me knows that I don't enjoy change. I don't. I'm not one of those guys who's out there trying to fix things that aren't broken. I like things the way they are, and I don't typically like change. Maybe you're that kind of a person. I know this, that it, I, I will walk into Walmart with a picture of something that my wife, she'll actually take a picture of something like scrubbing bubbles or something like that. You know, you too, right? And I've got a picture on my phone of scrubbing bubbles. And I will go in there and I'll walk up to that to that aisle and there's nothing that looks like what's on my picture. And she says, you know, she, she even knows where it is. If there's a list, she actually puts them in order for me. But I come up there and I look at the picture of the scrubbing bubbles and they've changed the label. They've changed the label. And if I get it wrong, if I buy the wrong thing, I'm going to go home and I'm going to get beat. I'd probably get beat for saying that. But the bottom line is this, that I need, I've got to get the right thing, but they changed the label. Do they do that on you? Do they change the, the, the label on cereal? They shouldn't be allowed to do that. Cheerios should always be in a yellow box. And Wheaties should always be in an orange box. They're not allowed to change the labels as far as I'm concerned. How can I find it? Do you mean I'm going to have to read it? The fact is they'll do this in meal deals. You go up to, to Chick-fil-A or you go up to McDonald's and you say number five and you don't get exactly what you were looking for. Somebody changed it and some of us don't do well with this kind of change. Well, let me just tell you something. There's one thing that never changes and it's God. God is the one, the God of the Bible. He never changes. And if you're looking to live in a world that has no change in it, then it's not going to work out for you. Because the fact is things are constantly changing. And I mean things a bigger deal than changing the color of a cereal box. Things are constantly changing around us. And the world can feel sometimes like it's in upheaval. But it's really important for us that we understand that by God's grace, he's the only thing, the only one that never changes. Now, a few weeks ago, we broke the ice on Psalm chapter 9. And I'm just going to read there for just a moment. Follow with me, please, in Psalm chapter 9. And I'm going to pick up where we left off a few Wednesday nights ago in verse 6, Psalm 9 in verse 6. The Bible says, O thou enemy, destructions are come to a perpetual end, and thou hast destroyed cities. Their memorial is perished with them. Verse 7, but the Lord shall endure forever. And I remind you that the, the, the capital L-O-R-D means Yahweh or the name of God. It means the living God. God, the living God, he is the only one that shall endure forever. And think about it for just a moment. 
there are destructive enemies that will show up to do their thing. They just will. That's clear to us from verse six. He actually speaks to the enemy. O oh, thou enemy, as if you or I today could take and, and, and speak to this virus. And if we could, we would do our best to curse it and send it away from us. I know we would. The fact is the psalmist is saying here, hey, you, my enemy, destructions are come to a perpetual end. In other words, at some point, this is bound to happen. They will end. This thing right here. Remember my dad saying something to me on this line a few years back as a young man. And I don't know, even remember what the situation was. And he just said, you know what? I don't know what to tell you, except that I know that it helps me to know that there will be a time when this trouble will come to an end. It may be in seven minutes. It may be in seven days. It may be in 70 years when I'm with Jesus in eternity, but this trouble will come to an end. And whatever the trouble that you have, whatever the enemy that you have, they may be bringing their havoc. They may be doing their harm, but they will not always do their harm. There will be a day when this will end. There are fears. And, and for, for some of us, we may be concerned that the enemy is the virus, but honestly, the enemy might be, forgive me, fear itself. Because ultimately, we are hamstrung by fear of, of, of who touched that before I bought it. Oh no, it came in a box. Oh no, who touched the box? Oh no, who packed the box? And you, we see that there's more of an enemy than just a virus or just a, a, a villain across the fence. There's, there, there, there are more enemies than that. But ultimately, they really will do their thing. They still won't last for an, forever. There are enemies. They are destructive. But there will be an end to their destruction. Some of the enemies, he says here in verse 6, they have destroyed cities. He says, thou hast destroyed cities. You think about that. We can think of examples of this in history. But notice what he goes on and he says, whole cities, but they perish. Eventually, even the memory of them, their memorial is perished with them. In other words, hey, yes, indeed, there are enemies out there that maybe can destroy whole cities. And either the memory of that city is gone or for that matter, the memory of the enemy is gone. Because ultimately, the enemy will come. The enemy will do its thing. But eventually, the enemy will go away. And people will not even remember the enemy. Think about it for just a moment. Natural disasters. Pompeii destroyed a whole city. The, the, the Mount Vesuvius volcano destroyed the whole city of Pompeii. Think about the wickedness in the, uh, um, in the bombing of Paris or the bombing of London in World War II. Think about sickness like polio or influenza or Spanish flu. This coronavirus is not the first time that this country or this world has dealt with sickness that swept the globe and, and for that matter slaughtered many people in, in, in a much higher percentage than we're dealing with today. There have been many times when this has happened, but there are other enemies as well. There's the, the, the enemy abortion and, and the, the evil. There are evils that, that are, are, are all around us. And you think about these things. Someone mentioned this week how ironic it was that clinics were opened and churches were being asked to close. Now stop. I understand why churches are asked to close because this is a place where there's typically a collection of people. But I thank God that he knows about this. You can't think of anything maybe more sinister than the devil who would concoct these plans to try to keep churches empty and yet still to do his evil thing in clinics all around the nation and all, the, all around the world. What I'm saying to you is this. There are enemies. There are. There are sicknesses. There are diseases. And you know what? They're going to do their thing. They just are. They're going to do their thing. And ultimately, it is not they, though, that will last. These enemies will not last. First of all, there are destructive enemies. They show up to do their thing. But secondly, only the Lord lasts forever. We read that first, didn't we, in verse 7. But the Lord shall endure forever. Now think about it for just a moment. Sometimes we get a little confused with the name of God. But remember that he named himself. He named himself Yahweh, which means the I am or the one that always continues, the one that always exists. And so he's had no beginning. He's had no end. He continues to live. He is the I am. He is Yahweh. And so we're talking about the ones who last and the ones who don't. The enemies, the diseases, they don't last. But God, Yahweh, the living God, he always lives. He always lasts. No wonder we appeal to Jesus, the resurrection and the life today. 
because we're appealing to the one who lives. Let me read to you from Psalm 90. It's Moses talking, okay? Listen to what he says. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Listen to Psalm 102, verse 24 and following. I said, oh my God, do not take me away in the midst of my days. Your years are throughout all generations. Of old, you laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish. That's the heavens. The heavens will perish, but you, God, will endure. Yes, they will all grow old like a garment, like a cloak. You will change them and they will be changed. You know what God's going to do with the old heaven and the old earth? He'll rip them off like an old dirty t-shirt and throw it away. He says, you'll change them all right, like an old garment, but you are the same and your years have no end. Listen, God's people, we are in the hands of the God who never changes. We are in the hands of the one who always endures, the one who never goes away. We are in the hands of the one who always gets it right. And you can trust this God. And just think about it for just a moment. No wonder they were so amped when Jesus was there. And he said to them, he told them all about Abraham. And then he said, before Abraham was, I am. What was he saying? He was saying, I am the same guy the same God, the living one. And they picked up stones because they knew exactly what he was saying. They, he, was, he was equating himself with God. And so the bottom line is this. You trust that same God. He was the same God of Abraham. He was Jesus who stood in front of those people there in Jerusalem. And he is the same God that you're praying to tonight. You have every reason to pray to this God. He's the one constant. Diseases come and go. But God is that one constant, and we pray to that God tonight. When we're done, we're almost there. When we're done this evening, I'm asking you to gather everybody in the house. Ask them, hey, you, turn off your Nintendo Switch over there. Hey, you, turn that off and come on over here and join us. Everybody gather around. Tonight, we are going to pray to the one constant that there is, the one God. We're going to pray to that God this evening. And we're going to take his, our concerns to him. God is the one who never changes. There are destructive enemies that, that show up and they do their thing. But only Yahweh, the living God, only the Lord lasts forever. And lastly, the Lord will make things right. The Lord will make things right. Look again with me, please, at verse 7. Notice what it says there. It started out, but the Lord shall endure forever. He has prepared his throne for judgment and he shall judge the world in righteousness. He shall minister judgment to the people in righteousness. And so he said, the Bible says he prepares his throne. He's getting his throne or his power. This is the place where he will meet out. He will measure out judgment where he will deal with everything. Basically he's getting his chair ready. And he's setting the stage. He's getting things where they need to be. He prepares his throne in his power. Your God is on the throne. Your God is there. And he is ready to go. He is ready to measure out his judgment. And the Bible said there in verse 8, he will serve or he will minister judgment. He will serve his people in righteousness. You have situations tonight that perhaps have nothing to do with sickness or viruses. You have situations tonight that seem maybe have nothing to do with the things that were on our prayer list. But ultimately, you have situations, don't you? And I'm saying to you that your God will deal with you righteously. He will deal with you righteously and he will make things right. He will serve his people with righteous judgment and he will make things right. So I don't know what you do when you're trapped in the house and uh, you may have uh, 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 maybe catching up reruns. I've heard that Netflix has gone crazy and uh, everybody is there uh, uh, downloading all their content and these sorts of things. Uh, but I managed to get out a little, uh, a few family videos this last week uh, with the family. We watched some reruns and uh, some things that so helped me. I would never and could never show to you all. Um, but just laugh through some of these things. And of course, Dana uh, shows up with her tears uh, typically on cue. As we realized that those babies, those babies were so cute and so lovable. What in the world happened? You know, <laughs> what in the world happened that things are so, these kids are all grown up, but we see these little babies. You know, what we laugh sometimes when we see these videos of these little kids and um, babies, babies take some things so seriously. Like, like 
like um, uh, you say boo to a baby and that baby might uh, burst out crying. And or or on the other hand, you've a, a, a simple chore like um, putting down a flashlight so that a child can pick up a banjo to play for it. That 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 whole episode has got to be completely rehearsed and described and 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 with many, many syllables as the child explains to you exactly how he's going to return to the flashlight and pick it up. I think to myself, how, what what is this? The contrast for me is so great sometimes as I think about the things that are on this child's heart. And yet when that child grows up, those things just don't seem as important to that child anymore. As we as adults, some of those things that, that used to wind us up, you know what? There'll be a day when God's going to make those things right. And those things that seemed like they were so upsetting to us, things that bothered us so badly. And we're going to find out one day that, well, God was just taking care of things, wasn't he? And God had it all along. And I don't mean that, that uh, I should feel childish today. I know that God cares like any loving father cares. But I just mean that God's going to make it right. And we've got to trust. We've got to trust this God. As you gather your family together and gather the people in the room in the next few minutes, will you please take the time to pray and to tell this God, Lord, we're going to trust you. And we get it, Lord, that the things that seem so heavy for us tonight are things that, that, that one day you'll help us to understand. Things that you will, you will make right. And we're trusting you, Lord, tonight to assure our hearts and to make these things right. Hey, let me encourage you tonight when you go to prayer to pray to this unchanging God. Pray when you're confused. Rest tonight in his constancy. Even though you don't know what's going to happen with this, this enemy or that enemy, I want to encourage you to rest in his faithfulness. Rest in this unchanging God and know this, that you can trust this God to handle whatever enemies are in your life as you are a child of God. You can trust God to handle those enemies and you can align yourself tonight with his purposes. And by God's grace, you give him all of your troubles and you leave them with him tonight and trust him to handle those things. I remember when I was a kid that we uh, used to go down to Siesta Key Beach in Sarasota. And um, I remember that there were times when the waves were really, really high. I don't, I don't know. I must have been 10 or 12 years old. And um, I remember thinking that I could do fine out there as long as I went out with my older brother. He was four years older than I. And if I was 10 or 12, then that meant that he was 14 or 16 years old. And we'd go out there. And sure enough, we'd go out pretty deep. My feet were dangling. I couldn't feel the bottom at all. But I'm holding on to him. You know what? Same thing happened to me a couple years later when I started having kids of my own. And my, my uh, kids would come, and every time I'd, I'd drop into a swimming pool, my kids would come find me, and they'd cling to me like a squirrel in a bath. And they're just clinging to me, and you about couldn't get rid of these things. Just hold on. You know why? Because, because when there are waves and when things are unsure, we need an anchor. That's just what we need. We need an anchor. Tonight, I want to encourage you to be stayed upon Yahweh, the living God. Be anchored in Jesus Christ. And take your knees to him tonight. Please take the few, next few minutes. Let's gather around. Let's gather everybody around. I'm going to do the same with these people here in this room. With God's help tonight. Let's verify that we are anchored in him. And let's trust him to help us in the midst of this storm. Hey, thank you so much for, for being with us tonight. God bless you. Be safe. Good night.